verses 31 through 14, verse 13. Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through all the way to 14, 13. We will uh, read as we go because if you read it as a little longer passage, hope you might have read that yesterday and today, John chapter 13 and 14. If you haven't read, you will not understand what we are going to say. So stay awake. So we will try to tell you what we are going to say. All right, we are in the series, we are studying about the I am statements of Jesus. We started with the saying, uh, the first message that Sudhi was teaching from the uh, Gospel of John chapter 15, that I am the wine. So the thesis, the message that we learn is that we can have a perpetual communion with God to abiding in Christ. That is what the essence of Christian life. That is what we said. So same thing we will say today. That is the thesis of today's message also. We can have an intimate, perpetual, you know, undivided relationship, communion, intimacy with Jesus Christ. And that is what Christian life is. Christian life is not only just believing some dogmas and creeds that is part of it. It is not only just uh, be part of a denomination or a group. It is not only to be born into that part of the religious group. Rather, it is having an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what Christian life is all about. That is what Christianity teaches. That is what Jesus has taught. That is the round thing. So last seven weeks, that is what we are trying to learn. We are trying to emphasize this. This is very simple. But at the same time, that is a profound truth that we want to learn together. So that is the message. In one sentence, if you miss it in between, that is what it is. So today we start from the uh, Gospel of John chapter 13 onwards. Now this is called the upper room disclosure or the fair speech of Jesus. But there are so many farewell speech that we can read in history, in presidents, in emperors, and philosophers and people, those who all spoke those kinds of things. And the scripture itself that we see that the farewell speeches, you know, the entire book of Deuteronomy is nothing but the farewell speech of Moses himself. He is trying to, to challenge and charge the next generation to go and occupy the promised land that God has offered for them. And he is looking back what happened in the past and how God has led them. You know, all those things in that 33 chapters that we see, that's a long three sermons of, of, of Moses and that he says goodbye to, the, this, to his beloved people. In Acts chapter 20 that we read that Paul was in Ephesus and one of the touching farewell speeches that we see over there and he is entrusting the people to the hand of the elders and uh, surrender them to God himself and uh, charging them be careful and uh, this is what I have done. I am leaving now. I am just entrusting you to these people in your hands that we see over there. And But here we see this is one of the deeper teachings of Jesus to his disciples before he go from the earth at that time in John chapter 13 through 17. Chapter 13 that we see the foot washing ceremony as we have read yesterday that Jesus is demonstrating his humility and asking them to model as he is gone from the earth. This is the way you have to consider to each other. In chapter 14, we see about that extension of that teaching. You know, in chapter 14, we look into chapter 14 as a, at a glance actually. Then chapter 15 is the essence of it. That is a crust of this chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And chapter 15 is the center, the core truth actually. And Jesus saying this again and again, abide in me, remain in me, you know, dwell in me as I dwell in you. So this is an intimate relationship that your joy may be full. Full. And uh, not only joy may be full in the future, the joy may be full and complete here and now. You know, that is what chapter 15, that is the, the bull's eye actually. You know, one of the commentators say actually that is a bull eye of this entire teaching and everything that uh, bring come forth from chapter 15. That is what we see. Chapter 16 is more teaching about the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And chapter 17, as we know, is the high priest prayer. Jesus is praying on behalf of these people to the Father. 
and he modeled that you know as and the father and jesus is one and they will be one again he talk about the unity and dwelling in him so that is the in you know, the end their speech in chapter 13 through 17 that we see so today we look into chapter 14 in the chapter 14 there we see there are two concept and that is very simple again we try to go that is exegetically this is a way easy we can understand we were stretch little bit things out of the principles but will stay in the parameters of the this this thing two concept that we see chapter 14 verses 1 2 3 that jesus is saying that i am going back i'm going to prepare a place for you in the father's house i'm going back to prepare a place in the father's house or you know invariably we can say in heaven and then he said i i will eventually come back and i will take you back to myself you know the niv and all says that the house but he says that to be with me in niv but in esv and other translations very beautifully say that actually i will come back and take you to myself when it is in the future jesus says that i am going to prepare a place for you in the father's house and i will come back and take you to myself that is what chapter 14 verses 1 to 3 the first part of it the second part of it jesus talk about chapter 14 verses 20 17 and 23 especially and the rest of the portion what jesus is talking about over there is that but that is the future as he said meanwhile and the father son and the holy spirit is going to come and make a dwelling in your heart here right now so again this is a two things very simply we understand in chapter 14 i am going to prepare a place for you in the father's house and i will take you back and i will come back and take you back over there then and now meantime i am go- the father son and the holy spirit we are going to come and make a dwelling in your heart right now these are the two things so in between we see verse 6 I am the way the truth and the life so that is a key passage in chapter 14 so we can interpret or to understand in such a way and Jesus says this Christ or Jesus is the way and the only way to the father's house in future but to the father himself both now and in the future also Jesus is the only way to the the father's house and to the father himself he is the only way and to the father the father himself we look into that and that is we read chapter verses 1 through 15 that is what it is jesus christ is the only way to the father to the father's house and and or this is the way of life by the way that is what he says he is way he is the way he is the way of life also and that we will look into that and number two then christ reveals the truth and he himself is the truth he reveals the truth about the father because we have a distorted understanding about who the father who god is the disciples question that we see over here and jesus says that he reveal himself as the truth and truth about the father who god himself is then the third he says and that is verses 15 through 17 and chapter 14 14 verses 1 through 15 we read that christ is the way to the father and to the father's house and that is the only way and then he says he is the truth and he is a truth about the father also and reveal the father to us verses 15 through 17 and christ is the life and he gives and share this eternal life not only in the future when we are plugged into the source of life that life flow through us right now verses 18 through 24 so that is what dr 14 is at the glance i will repeat this again if you are taking notes or you are you know you didn't get it i will say this one more time the chapter 14 is divided into two part and the first part is jesus is going to prepare a house in the father a home a mansion a ho- room a place for us in the father's house and that and he will come back and take us to himself verses 1 2 3 and the rest of the part he talk about that jesus says that that is not only in the future right now today we are able to experience that life and that experience right now here and the father son and the holy spirit the tri- triunity the trinity the triune god come and dwell in us right here that is what the life that god wants us to experience while we are living on this earth 
Then the, the key passage is verse 6. I am the way, the truth and the life. And he says, I am the way to the father. And I am the way of life. And that is the rest of the part. I am the truth. And I am the truth revealed about the father. I am the life, the, the way that you live. And experience that eternal life in this world. That is what we see. So let's go back in chapter 13 to get the context. And we pick up from there. And we just... Uh, Try to go fast and uh, you know learn this uh, you know, deep and important and essential truth that at the same time this is familiar to many of us and we will encourage us to uh, to dwell on this truth into our life again. Chapter thirteen, verse thirty-one onwards. Let's read together. When he was gone, Jesus said, "Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will glorify the Son in Himself." And will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And we'll continue to read as we come other places. Look at the surprise of the disciples over here. And Jesus is telling them, Basically, I am going to go, you know, and they left their job, they left their career, they left their parents, they left their, their business, they left everything. And they were convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. So they followed him and walked with him and they left everything. And this was their dream. This was their life. And this is what they want to do with their life. And all of a sudden, Jesus is dropping this bombshell. And he was continually talking about this. But this comes very intense at this moment. And he's telling him, I am going to go. Not only that I am going to go, the place I go, you cannot follow me now. That was he saying, you cannot follow me now. So they were puzzled by that thing. And then he gave them an assignment for in his absence. What is that? He says that a new command I give you in verse 34. Love one another. Why it is a new command, that one? We read in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You know, in the Old Testament itself, that it says, that love your neighbor as yourself. That was not a new command then. Why it is a new command then? But the next sentence is crucial there. As I have loved you. Why this is new? You know, the Old Testament prescribed that we have to love our neighbors the way that we love ourselves. That is part of the requirement. But here now Jesus says that you love the way that I loved. And how did he love by the way? He not only loved his neighbors, not only loved his friends, he loved even the enemies. He is not only he loved himself and the way that he loved others, he was willing to sacrifice himself for others even when they were sinners. And that is the standard of love that Jesus is telling to his disciples, to us also. And that is the standard the world will measure that whether we are the children of God or not. It is not only through the manifestations of the things, but the application of the truth that the master has taught us the way that we love one another. So that is an important implication that we have to pay attention over there also. So he's telling the disciples, what is your duty in my absence? Love one another the way that I have loved you. Then Peter asked this question. And Peter is very good in asking questions to Jesus. He asked this question. Simon Peter asked him. You know, he didn't dwell about the love part, by the way. He jumped into because he's anxious to know that where Jesus is going, that I cannot go. And he asked this question, Lord, where are you going? I didn't understand what you're talking. He's asking the question, the place. 
where are you going by the way in chapter 13 and 14 this portion there are three or four questions that jesus is answering from peter where are you going from thomas how do we reach there the path and philip is asking who is that person that we are going to meet them over there in judas not the judas iscariot judas the tadius he is asking will you demonstrate that to us why don't you demonstrate that to this world and thus four questions jesus is answering in during this conversation over here so peter asks this question where are you going Jesus is answering to him again Jesus replied where i am going you cannot follow now but you will follow me later you know he is telling him peter you can come but not now you will follow me later then you know we'll come back to that again verse 37 the people ask again lord why can't i follow you i will lay down my life for you remember that sometimes we give a bad press for peter all the time but believe this remember this actually the word that peter was saying he is absolutely convinced about his convictions as far as he knew he was so sincere when he said that i lay down my life for jesus he was so sincere as far as he knew that what he says that commitment that he is proclaiming before the master is true as far as he knew and he was so sincere about that there is nothing wrong that there. there was no duplicity in that that declaration that he says that i will lay down my life for him that is what he wants to do sincerely that is what he want to do that is what he knows he look into his own heart that is what he sees he left everything to follow christ you know this is what he, wherever he lead me we are i am willing to go that was his thing but the problem is this actually you know many of all of us and in the matter part peter and all of us we don't even know our words as well that is a problem that is a problem that is what the master jesus is telling him you know what you said is right about yourself but there are things that you don't know about yourself that the master knows that is important thing that is what jesus is telling him so lord is, is revealing you know his weakness to him the trouble was that peter did not know himself anywhere well enough that he should know about himself and that may be a thing for us also so the only way we are able to overcome our weaknesses is that that should be you know to be made we have to confront with that weakness we have to bring that before the master we have to admit that it is there we have to repent of it and get rid of it that is the only way we are able to overcome the weaknesses in the life but unfortunately even jesus told him you know he couldn't understand that at that point so he had to learn that in the hard way but you see the grace of the master again we read in luke chapter 22 you know in this context was in a different light that we see luke give it a more light over there jesus is telling him simon satan has asked me to sift you like a wheat but i have prayed for you so that your faith will not fail and after you will be restored and you will lead your your brothers also so this is not the end of it actually Jesus knew what is going to happen and there is a precaution that he gives to him at the same time there is a protection Jesus already made through interceding for him so remember that that is the truth about our master we may make two mistakes sometimes about our our weakness either we ignore it and say that it is not there at all you know that sometimes you no know, look at me you know i am the holiest you know i can i can handle all these things i have the resources you know i have the knowledge i have the will power i have the determination i fast i pray i know all these things but remember that none of all those things combined together our intellect or our emotions or our will or our knowledge or our training or our acquaintance none of those things are not enough sometimes to overcome our weakness and face the temptations in life that will only happen by trusting the master by only yielding to the holy spirit when we are cooperate with the holy spirit that is what the sanctification actually take place in our lives sometimes we make that mistake we ignore that it is not there at all or some other time what happens we dwell too much on the weakness also too much on the weakness you know when we go for interviews and all there is a question they all ask really can you state one of your weakness 
we always try to get you know in a positive way actually i am a workaholic that may be my weakness you know <laughs> as if i have no other weakness we are afraid that if i say i have a weakness whether they will hire it or not so we try to you know use polished languages and all kinds of things along with that we don't want to admit that there is a weakness that is a problem the other side actually we sometimes dwell only on the weakness so let us improve our weakness but there is another side of it there is a book called the strength 2.0 you know those who want to read for managers leaders it's a good book actually they focus on strength only Okay, weakness is there we already know so what is the use of you know dwelling too much on that let us work on our strength you know that's that is little different thing but what here we can do you know don't dwell on the failure all the time but we what we do we forsake the repent of it come back and you know we walk with the lord that the victory the christ has given to us knowing that he is interceding he is praying he is standing with us and he will restore us he is not write them off actually you know that is what god has done for each of us god gives us second chances after the resurrection we read that jesus tells and go and tell peter also tell him that is specific go and tell peter also the compassion of the master that we see over here so we go further here this is a context that comes chapter 14 now there is a break in between the chapters by the way in the original right so it's so the same breath this is talking here so it's not a new thing that happened later this is a same breath jesus is talking so keep that in mind then so jesus is talking to the disciples and uh, jesus is telling uh, peter that you will deny me three times and i am going to go and these two statements you know not only that he says that i am going to go he says that peter is going to deny me that was a shock to the disciples you know peter is the strongest among us and he is a spokesman he walked on the water with the master you know he is very good in everything and you know, he don't even care about lay down his life for jesus you know we are little reserved people but peter he don't care but if, if peter will not stand and he will deny the master what about us <laughs> that's what going into their mind the same breath jesus tell them do not your heart be troubled trust in god trust also in me trust in god trust also in me that is what jesus tell them trust also in me what does that mean then over there jesus tell them no 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 listen to this now i am telling you these things but listen what do you do trust is the word there trust is the word you know some other translators they believe that's the word what is trust i think trust has more force to understand trust is what it is trust is simply there it is a it is a command it is an imperative and it's an indicative also when you look at the root and the, all the commentators try to say unanimously agree over there they say actually it is an imperative it is a command trust in me that's a command it is an invitation also trust me that's an invitation it's a command it is an invitation it is an imperative it is an indication what is trust simply trust is you know faith in action you know we all know the truth we all know the information part of it the noun part of the faith we all know you know you can ask you the question you have the right orthodoxy you have the right doctrine we know all these things but here understand this what jesus is saying not only that not only you know about the messiah you not only that you know the jesus is the son of god not only all those theoretical matters here jesus is trust you know put your faith into action the best definition is that you lean your weight upon someone else that is what trust that word means lean your weight upon someone else believing that that person will hold you that's what it is that, that, that he will not let you go and so in the root language or in the original that word is believing in someone that's what word it is so that's what jesus is explaining i believe again there trust in god trust in me it is a command this morning if you come with a sense of failure and you think that there is only weakness that we see in your life the master is here willing to give us a second chance and he inviting us trust me trust me that is invitation the master makes here faith in action but look at that again in the trust matter the object of trust that makes all the difference the object of trust is make all the difference it is not trusting in anything else it is not wishful thinking by the way trust in him so why you are sitting there so comfortably 
and some of you are even sleeping without thinking anything you know <laughs> why it is that you believe this pew will hold your weight you know no matter what happens i will be secure here that's why right so you don't care actually right that is that's why you are sitting on that place that is a reason the same thing you know you believe that he is able to hold me he is able to my sometimes even my commitment i don't know i don't even know you know we don't know enough of us actually today we say that i will be willing to die for jesus but only god knows what about the future also and he says a trust also in me and then he tells him the rest of the things he says that you know i am going and i am going for your advantage and in going and he said ah, but i i am not just going i am not going forever i will be coming back the coming back also three ways in 14 that we read coming back in three different ways we can understand that here we read jesus says in verse 3 i am going to prepare a place for you i will come back and uh, we read later in uh, in chapter uh, 14 verse 15 onwards or 18 i will not leave you as orphans i will come back to you and in verse 23 the last part of it i will come to him and make your home with him so three ways we understand in chapter 14 about the coming back number one he says that i am going to the cross i will be resurrected i will be back and this is the end of it by the way i will be back i will be back and the second thing is says i am going to prepare a place for you as we have said earlier i am going to prepare a place for you and i will be back and take you over there and the third understanding as we have said earlier this is another repetition he says that we will come back we means the triune god the father son and the holy spirit we will come back and dwell in you not among you but in you that is the three ways he says i will be back i will be back in resurrection i will be back in the future kingdom i will be back today right now here and dwell in you i will be back so this is the glorious hope that we have we are learning from last week also the chief shepherd when he appear you know we are going to be with him forever and ever this is a future this is that's why we read this for funerals this is what we read for when we have a difficult times when death happens we read this portion because we remind ourselves that this is not our permanent home we are just pilgrims we are sojourners we are just passing by we are just travelers here our permanent home is in heaven jesus called again with an intimate name it is the father's house that is what we read the apostles explained that in later in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 51 through 54 read that please first corinthians chapter 15 verse 51 through 54 he says behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump no, not this trump actually in the last trumpet you know for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on the incorruption and this mortal must put on the immortality but when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall come to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory this is our future one day you know the the lowly bodies is going to be transformed we are going to have this glorious body you don't have to go to gym at that time you have to eat vegetable that time you have to do any of those things you know you are going to be transformed into the image of jesus christ and paul explained that in the in first corinthians chapter 15 in the resurrection chapter and we read last week also as uh, he was reading for first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 14 through 17 and we go further in revelation that we read revelation chapter 1 verse 5 through 6 it says unto him the loves us and loosed us from our sins by his blood and he made us a kingdom priest unto his god and father to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever amen and we are going to be in heaven heaven is a prepared place for the prepared people and jesus call it as the father's house you know i hope we can dwell here and say much of it but that is what it says that is our future we are going to be with the him forever and ever words are not enough to explain it so the bible used the word called the anthropomorphosis you know the word that is you able for us to understand so many of the description may not be exactly what it is that is only way understand the climax of our imagination is talk about that that is what this is my father's house 
but he goes further there how do we reach there that is a question verse 6 that is a thrust that we understand over here and uh, the perfect eternal state and he says i am going to prepare a place for you and christ uh, the second thing is this christ is the way to the father here verse 4 through 14 jesus said he is going to prepare a place for us in the father itself now he is moving to the second part providing the father and the son a dwelling place for them the first one was more physical and the second one he is talking about more spiritual so that is why they have more questions over over there so thomas said to him you know thomas asked him this question lord you know, thank you for all this wonderful information, by the way. But we don't know where you are going. And that was the question of Peter. And Thomas asked another question now here. By the way, which is the way, by the way? How do we reach there? Thank you, all these wonderful promises. But how do we, how can we know the way? That was his question. Then Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father. Look at here, the, the phrase changed there. Earlier Jesus said, you know, to the Father's house, a, a place. Here Jesus says, to the Father. Is there a difference between the Father's house and the Father? To the Father? Is there a difference between the Father's house and to the Father? Earlier one place that we read in John chapter 2, verse 16, when Jesus was cleansing the temple, he called the temple as the Father's house also. So is there is a difference over here? Or what is that over here? You know, this is the problem we understand here. You know, yes, we all want to go to heaven. Many of our salvation is a fire insurance actually. You know, we, are, we raise our hands, we file the, you know, uh, form, or we walk the aisle, or even we be baptized in that matter actually. So I am ready to go to he heaven. That's all it matters. That is what many people take it actually. So nothing in between doesn't matter at all. That's why many people try to leave. But here Jesus says, that, no, that is not the issue here. It's not only the day that you go there. Can you go to the Father's house and without enjoying him? You know, here on the earth actually, you go, you know, you go to, you go to President's library and all, you know. Again, I'm not going to any foundation in particular, you know, any library you go. And the President is not there, but you went to the President's house or his library, right? The President is not there. You, know, you, you travel in a distant place and in the town. You want to visit a friend. And you went there, the friend's house. The friend is not there. You can visit a place, but you cannot have a fellowship. You can do that in heaven for sure. But look at here actually, what is happening? You know, many people, they want to go to the father's house without having any fellowship and enjoyment with the father here. That is the problem. That is the ungodliness. That is the unholiness. People want everything their father can provide but they don't want anything to do with the father at all. You know, how do we know that this? Remember that. If the father's presence is boring to us, we are only just using the father for our own advantage. You, you get that? That is a thing. But how do we know that this? Remember that. This is crucial. The Christian life, when we started from this series, we said actually, we can have perpetual communion. You know, abiding in him, living in him. And a bold statement that day that so you made was that this is a means. Salvation that we talk about born again is a means to the end. This is not the end in itself. So we come back to the same theme here. That is what Jesus is trying to show. This is not only the way to life. This is the way of life. How do we know that is again? Is we are making up something? No. Look at the New Testament again. You know, Paul's all phraseology was this. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. There is a communion. There is a fellowship. And the people outside call the disciples of Jesus as the people of the way. The people of the way. Christians was a nickname. Gave them to ridicule them. They said, these guys are look like the other guy. <laughs> that is what Christian means actually. So if you take the Christ out of it, as uh, you know, somebody said, the, what do you end up there? You take Christ out of it, only Ian there. Christ is not there, only Ian. There's a lot of Ians in the church actually, but they have nothing to do with the Christ. That's not the Christ. So Jesus says that, I am the way to the Father. I am the way of life also. That is what Christianity is all about. This is not just a set of rules or dogmas and creeds or any of those things. This is the way of life. This is the way of life. If that is not there, we are not able to enjoy the Father here right now. 
it doesn't matter how you go there people are thinking about the the, the gold streets and you know the rooms they get and the question they ask do we recognize each other some people don't want to go to even heaven and stay with someone else close to actually they say all the questions you know these all the questions you know there is a book called uh, 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 ranji alcon wrote what was heaven heaven you know there is there is a book and there is beautiful way but all the questions that always people ask actually about actually those kinds of things actually do we have these and do we have that do we plasma tv in heaven will we show there all the things about what i will get even there also god is not concerned about only that thing he took it i give myself to you in earlier that jesus saying that i will take you to myself in the old testament the same phraseology used actually when the people are taking i don't remember the reference actually i believe it is somewhere else in exodus chapter 19 jesus god tells them actually i am taking not to a place in canaan but i am taking to myself so this is what we are discussing this is what we are talking about this is what we have to grow that we are doing all through this year we are encouraging jesus says that i am the way we traditionally take it and say jesus is the only way and we try to apologetically prove all those things that is also true but in this today we look at a different angle to remind ourselves that this is the way of life to the father he is proposing here in something more than from the first part to the second part he says that not only i am talking about the day that you are going to be there i am talking about that we are going to come and dwell in you that's what he says that is what christian life is. are you enjoying that i will be able to enjoy that though this is a dreadful thing it's a boring thing another legalistic thing or oh, if it is a sunday we have to go is that is a thing or as the psalmist says when they said let us go to the house of the lord or the father's house or in god's presence i was excited or you walk up and said oh another sunday <laughs> that's what we said or are willing to come that is also true let's go further here i am the way the way of life philip asks this question again then verse 8 he asks this question oh lord you know show us the father then if that is the case philip's question is that like the question that many of us if you come and reveal yourself in our midst right now it could be very easy for us to believe i have heard that people many times ask this question again if god why god is not doing that kind of miracle then so easy for people to believe last is couple of weeks ago we have seen jesus is raising lazarus from the dead and opening the blind eye what was the discussion there oh this is a messiah let us fall before him they are he he opened the eyes on a sabbath day so he cannot he was reasoning with that jesus is standing doing all these miracles how many people believed not everyone else so we cannot just dwell on the miracle only here comes little further here philip is very sincerely asking lord why don't you show the father now so it will be easier jesus is explaining again then if you have seen me you have seen the father more spiritual he says actually paul explained that in colossians chapter 1 verse 15 christ is the image of the invisible god hebrew 1 3 we read about christ he is the radiance of his glory and the very image of his substance no one uh, john said in john 1 18 No one has seen God at any time but the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has told him about he revealed himself to us and John wrote earlier that the grace become uh, the, the, the word become flesh and dwelt among us we have seen his glory and Philip and Peter and Thomas and James and John what are they doing here they are conversing with the son of god himself here with the god himself in this context they were able to understand that jesus is revealing here more than so first of all he says this not only i am going to prepare a house for you in the future you can have that experience right now right here that is the way of life but they didn't understand that so he go further just go back and see that jesus says i am the way to the father and i am the way i am the way i am the way to the father and i am the way and he says christ he is the truth about the father and he is the truth and what happened here remember this actually because devil has did a you know a fantastic job to give a distortion about who god is in the garden of eden itself remember that the first story that all of us know what happened there god the, say, the devil told adam and eve god is not a guy that you can hang around too much actually but he take all the fun of your life that is what he asked you don't do this don't do that all kinds of things actually he, he didn't tell you he is a liar 
because he didn't tell you what happened if you eat that. He is told only not to eat that. If you eat that, what happened? You will be like God. That means what? He is a liar. Who tells this? The father of lies telling to the people that he is a liar. That is what exactly what happened around us now also, right? Without being political, we understand all these things, right? You can be that and say the other thing. That distortion is still in our mind. It is still here. When we talk about God, what comes to our mind about God? There are 114 times, I believe, if I, if I remember right, you know, I think 114 times that Jesus mentioned in this context about what about God? What is he calling God? What is he calling God? Father! Father! He talk about heaven again not as a place. He talk about as the Father's house. He talk about the temple. He is not a place of worship. Rather, he call it as the Father's Jesus sharing this revelation about who real God is. Who is God? He is the Father. He is, this is the intimacy again we come. The same thing we are trying to repeat it. Remember what he says. Jesus says that God is the Father. That is the truth. I don't know what is your understanding about God this morning. But we came not to just a place and just worship a God who is distant out there. The biblical understanding of God's nature is this. God is transcendent and God is imminent. God is transcendent means he is out there. He is a creator. He is a one of a kind. He, there is no one else like him. He is above all other things. And there is no comparison whatsoever at all. You cannot reach his, that clarity. You will never understand how he thinks and all. At the same time, the other side of it is he is imminent. He is our father. In the Apostles' Creed starts like this. I believe in God Almighty, the Father, Creator of heaven and earth. That is our, that is our faith. That is our declaration. So that is the truth we understand. That God is a, not a father. God is the father. The truth he understands over here. And then what is the problem here then? So still we aren't able to understand the truth of it. Jesus goes on further and says that what happened, what I will do then. Jesus said, I am the truth. No one comes to me, comes to the father apart from me. Then what I will do? I will ask the father and he will send, verse 17, the spirit of truth. And why is the spirit of truth here? You know, we know the Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness, he is the spirit of grace, in the spirit of God, in the spirit of Christ. There is so many other names that was given to the Holy Spirit. But here specifically Jesus says, he is the spirit of truth and he will guide you into all the truth. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit, now what Jesus says again is actually, you are not going out there. We are going to come and dwell in you. And the Holy Spirit's ministry is this, in Romans 5.5 5, we read, the hope does not put us to shame. Romans 5.5 5. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Not the love for God. The love of God being poured out into our heart by the Holy Spirit. When we read the scripture, we don't read this as a literary device that was written thousands of years ago. Rather the Spirit of God, the author of the scripture, Reveal the truth about God into our heart. This becomes so real to us. We understand that this is the love letter the Father has written to us. This is not just some history or dogmas or creeds or literature. The Spirit, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He poured out His love into our heart and reminding us that I am a child of God and God is my Father, God is my Father. Coming to the Father means, so He coming to the Father. The Spirit comes and He says here, the Spirit comes, what happened then? The ministry of the Holy Spirit. We don't have the time. A little up here. Let me go further here. You know, chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. What is the ministry of the Holy Spirit? What is the ministry of the Holy Spirit? There we read, but when the Spirit of truth comes and He will guide you into all the truth. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is this. Jesus says, I am the truth. I will reveal the truth about the Father. And the Spirit of truth will come. And He will guide you into all the truth. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not the, 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 the spirit of confusion, by the way. But in the Spirit of God speak, there is clarity. 
There is no confusion whatsoever at all. This is clear to understand. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he will not speak his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking about what is mine and making it known to you. This is the ministry. The function of the Holy Spirit is to bring glory to God all the time. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the truth to us. Because of the distortion. Philip asked question, who is that father by the way? And Jesus is answering that those who have seen me have seen the father. Not only that, the spirit of truth will come and it will reveal to you more. And it, he, will, not it, he will help you to walk in truth. And that intimacy again increase over here. And then he says three, I am the truth, I am the way to father, I am the way of life, I am the truth and I reveal the truth about the father and the Holy Spirit comes and give you and reveal you more of his truth. And then Jesus says that I am the life. Christ is the life and he shares with us the life of the father. He shares the life of the father in us. And then he changes the word over here. And he says over here, he says, as I am in the Father, you are also in me. Or this may be a little difficult for us to conceive. In a little, in a little sense, the same way the Father and Son are one, as he was praying in chapter 17 also, now we are in Christ and Christ is in us. This is what the union, this is the communion that we have with Christ now. And Jesus is dwelling in us. And even when, but what Jesus is doing here, Jesus is opening his mouth and he is talking to disciples. So, so it doesn't mean that when Jesus comes to your heart, we become a machine and automatically all the things happen. No. And the Holy Spirit dwell in us. Christ lives in us. And we exercise and use you know, our will, our emotions also along with that. And God, Christ is a source of it. And he uses it for his glory. When we are plugged again with the source of life, the life flow through us. That is the life that we live. John 10.10 10, that we read earlier and learned extensively. Other times also, the, the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I come to give life and life in abundance. So this is what we call the abundant life. You know, there is a, in a great preacher who died, and uh, David Wilkerson. He called this context, he said, the ascension life. The essential life. It's a beautiful expression. The essential life. What is by mean by this is actually. You know, while we are living in this earth, Jesus is telling him, I am going to the cross. I will be resurrected and I will be back. I am going to prepare a place for you. And I will come back and take you over there. But meantime, in between this, meantime, we are going to come and dwell in you. The same way Jesus lived on this earth, you are able to live above your circumstances, above your situations, above your problems by this resurrection power. When? Right now. So in John chapter 17 that we read, now this is eternal life. Eternal life is not a futuristic thing. Now this is the eternal life. When? Now. It starts the moment you connected with the Christ. It starts right there in itself. But we, Jesus is telling him over here, let us go back where we read. Remember what we can live in that realm. Last week we learned that about a little bit about it. Now we can live in that realm. By the way, where is Jesus now? Where is Jesus now? He's in the Father's right hand side, right? He's in heaven in that sense. And he's dwelling in us. He's living in heaven. And we can be there. That's what it says. You are still, your face tells me actually, will you please stop this? I will read one more portion before I stop actually. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. Look at this actually. This is very important for me, I believe. It's very crucial. Look at this actually. I will show this and finish here. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in his mercy because of his great love, with the, he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse 6. This is important. Look at this. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Can you let us read that together one more time? That six verse only. And raised us up together and made us 
sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, let's ask this question then. Where are you now? In Pave 13501 community road, locationally, that is true. But where are you now? We are in Christ, seated along with Him. So where are you now? So this is the advantage of it. Look at this actually. This is the advantage of it. When we talk to people, it is very easy to many things. Very, very obvious. It's black and white. But the people don't make sense of it actually. What is so confusion about it? We don't understand. But you, why you are able to make a decision in those places? Do you think they are smarter than them? You know why it is? God has opened your eyes. You have an advantage. Because you are sitting above and looking down. So you are able to see everything. Based upon that you are able to make a decision. The people just living for this world and dying for this place. Because our body was created by the earth. Sustained by the earth. Go back to earth. That is all it is. It's go like that and go back. No matter how many hours you spend in gym, you will die one day. For sure, I will tell you that. You know? So we all will die. What happened when you die? We will give a beautiful funeral. We will make sure that we will do it. And finally, after that, what we do? We will put this. Now, whether you are Michael Jackson or Aishwarya Rai, we put that. That is all that happens. So you go back there. But for this world, people live and passionate and do all these things. But you and I are able to live above that. How can that be? Because you are able to see something from a different point of view. You have an advantage that you are seated alone with the Christ. Now that is what Christian life is. Paul tells them again and again in Ephesians, understand this truth. And he pray for them. May God open their eyes, reveal yourself to them. What is her position in Christ? This is all we are saying last seven weeks. We as Christians, as God's children, this is not just come and go thing. This is an intimate relationship. Positionally, I am seated with the Christ now. I am able to see things in a different perspective now. Because I am with the him. This is the truth. This is the way of life. This is the life that I live right now. And we finish here. You know, when pastor says finish, I know he goes. I have 10 more pages to go. Let me close here actually. So I'll finish one more thing. But how do you reach? How did Jesus went and sat on the right hand side of the father? How did Jesus did that? What happened before that? Make up please. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? What happened in between? Say, just say louder. You know, no problem. He died. And he rose again. So the question now. So how can you be seated in the right hand side of the father? You die. Die to yourself. Die to your sin. Die to your ambitions. Die to all those things. Then and there only. Last week we learned the experience about, about Stephen. How did Stephen saw the glory? How did Stephen reach there? Stephen was Dead. He didn't see the stones that comes against him. He saw the glory up there. That is ascended life means. You are above and looking and seeing things from a different perspective. You are seated alone with the Christ. In spite of everything that happens. Jesus is telling Peter that answer. Peter you will not be able to follow me now. But you will be able to follow me later. That is what exactly happened to Peter. Jesus restored him. He became a mighty apostle and he preached. Thousands came to the Lord and he established churches in every places. Finally, he was crucified as the tradition says, upside down. He was taken up there. He went the same way that Jesus went. That's the only way, by the way, to be seated alone with the Christ. This is not just a half-hearted thing. This is not about wishwashy thing. This is not just come and go thing. This is the same. So this is what it means then. The theology that we believe on Sunday has no effect upon us on Monday. It is a good theology, right theology, but there don't be a good theology. That is what exactly what we are trying to say. So this is our prayer. This is our passion. This is what we exist for as a church. To know, love and share Jesus Christ. And to know that Jesus is the only way and he is the way of life. He is the truth. He revealed the truth about the Father. And I am a child of God. God is my father. This is the eternal life. Everlasting. And also this is the abundant life. The ascended life. We are living with Jesus Christ. And last seven weeks we are learning this. And I pray that any of you. And as we ask every week. You know we are asking this actually. If you don't know this truth. In this understanding. We pray that God will open your eyes. And you will make that commitment to the Lord. And not only you just believe certain things and come to be part of a group. Rather you will know Christ. And every day 
not only when you die and go to heaven today right now you enjoy the indwelling and the uh, the communion of the holy spirit would you please pray along with me this morning and the days are ending here is ending i was praying again this year that anybody those who are not obey the lord in baptism we pray that you know before the end is over now you can make a commitment lord i want to, uh, to obey i want to follow this christ he the 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 the, the bread of life i want to follow this christ who opened the door for me to the father i want to follow this good shepherd i want to experience his uh, resurrection life i want to be with him i want to abide in him as the as a wine i want to experience him in a deeper level church this is our prayer this is our prayer for our children this is our prayer for our youngsters our prayer for each of us as paul prayed for the galatians until christ may form in you i am in birth pain this is the pain that we have this is the burden that we have this is a passion that we have this is why we spend time together this is why come weekend after weekend this is why we gather together at times to to you know develop that intimacy with jesus christ you are seated alone with the christ this morning experience that don't think about your failures and dwell in that forsake it repent of it give that to the master he will make something beautiful out of it let us pray together as we are going to pray you know we may sing this last song and we will pray together after that let us sing together as we sing you know think about this actually i am the way the truth and the life don't be panic jesus says trust in me put your faith into action trust in jesus trust in him he is inviting us to trust him to enjoy and experience this deeper life this uh, this abundant life this ascended life the life you are able to live above our circumstances difficulties and challenges yes we have weakness we have problems you know, we are failures none of us are not perfect people but when we plug into that source of life that is where he is enabling us to live the victorious life hallelujah Thank you Jesus. Let us sing and let us praise the Lord together. All the way my savior leads me what have I to ask beside can I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide heavenly peace divine comfort here by faith in him to dwell for i know whatever befalls me jesus do with all things well For I know whatever befalls me Jesus do it all things well